I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Hello and welcome to another Tuesday 10 Talk. I'm your host, Scott Foster, and welcome to 2021, or as I like to call it, 2020, who stuffed 2021 in the hall closet and is now running around in disguise, acting like it's 2021. What a January. It's the first three weeks. January is supposed to be the nice, quiet, sit back, and let's just, let's just ease on into the new year. But no, no. That couldn't happen. January 6th happened. That changed all of that. Some call it an insurrection. I call it a terrorist event. Now, the inauguration of the 46th president, Joe Biden, and the 49th vice president, Kamala Harris, was always going to be different because of the pandemic. The pomp and circumstance was going to be just a little subdued. But January 6th, change it even more because of the concern of more issues and more security threats the events will be like none other before but before we jump into what's going to happen this inauguration let's jump back and talk a little bit about the history of the events that surround the transition of power in the united states and shows to the world that there's a new president in town. The first inauguration, that of George Washington, took place on April 30th, 1789. All subsequent inaugurations from 1793 until 1933 took place on March 4th, because that by constitution was the day that the government started. Congress and the president worked their day, their day started on March 4th. George Washington's inauguration took place right here in New York City, because that was the first capital in the United States. But you knew that. It wasn't until 1801 when Thomas Jefferson was inaugurated in Washington, D.C., which became the permanent place of the capital of the United States. Inauguration Day moved to January 20th, beginning in 1937 with the ratification of the 20th Amendment to the United States Constitution, where it has remained ever since. On January 20th, the first day of the new term, some 72 to 78 days after the presidential election. The inaugurations have traditionally been outdoor public ceremonies. In 1909, William Taft's inauguration was moved indoors into the Senate because, well, a blizzard. Then in 1986, the second inauguration of Ronald Reagan was moved indoors because it was just too damn cold. Now, of course, the inauguration of a president has always been a popular event, at least as long as I have been alive. And there's been some milestones. So in 19, in, in 1829, Andrew Jackson spoke to a crowd of nearly 10,000 people. The Bush inaugurations, both Bushes, had around three to 4,000 people in their inaugurations. While President Obama saw almost 2 million people his first term and almost one million people his second term. And that first term was even in 20 degree weather. And there's been some other milestones as throughout history, history, as our communications and as our technology evolved, so too has the presentation and the communication of the inauguration. It's just some interesting things to see when certain things happen. Because who can imagine not 
hearing a presidential address on the radio or not seeing it on TV. But in 19, uh, 1857, the inauguration of James Buchanan was the first inauguration known to have been photographed. Everybody else just drew pictures before then. Eighteen ninety-seven, the inauguration of William McKinley, who was assassinated, by the way, first inauguration to be recorded on film. Nineteen twenty-five, the inauguration of Calvin Coolidge, first inauguration to be broadcast nationally by radio. So you could sit home by the fire, a nice January afternoon, and listen to your president get inaugurated. 1949, the inauguration of Harry Truman, the first inauguration to be televised. That's just wild to me. Only, only 20 years before I was born was the first televised inauguration. 1961, the inauguration of John F. Kennedy, Kennedy the first inauguration to be televised in color. Woohoo! And also, with the rise of the internet and YouTube and all that other stuff, Twitter and all this, 1997 brought us the second inauguration of Bill Clinton, but also the first time it was publicly aired, if you will, on the internet. Just some of the milestones of the inauguration as it relates to our communication and our technology. So just like any ceremony, there are pieces that happen every time, regardless of who and where the inauguration is happening. The first is the oath of office. The vice president is sworn in at the same time and is usually done first. At noon, the president and vice president's term begins with the oath of office for the newly elected president of the United States. Since the 1797 inauguration of John Adams, it has become customary that the Supreme Court Chief Justice is the one who, who initiates and oversees the oath of office. Now, something interesting to point out. It's not in the Constitution. It is not law by Congress or anyone else that there's a book or sacred text to be used in the swearing in, of the oaths. By convention, incoming presidents raise their right hand and place their left one on the Bible or another book while taking the office. While most have John Quincy deny he's a Bible, neither did Theodore Roosevelt. And more recently, a Catholic missal, what we have in church, was used by Lyndon Johnson. I found it quite interesting when I learned that there is not necessarily, it's, you don't have to put your hand on anything. And then of course comes the inaugural address, which is they're sworn in, their first duty, their first thing they do as a president is speak to the nation with their hopes, goals, and future, and plans, and, and just a, hopefully, a usually patriotic moment. Just to stir up that patriotism as you listen to your new president speak. Or your old president speak new again. And of course, we have lines and quotes that come from these speeches even today. In 1933, FDR avowed the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In 1961, JFK declared, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Strong words, powerful words. Almost every inaugural address is followed by prayers and poems. 
And that is the bulk of the ceremony that you see on the steps of the Capitol in the, in the rotunda there. And then comes the pass and review, where it's almost like the traditional passing of the military from one president to another. As the vice president and the president and their families watch as the procession of military goes by. And then finally, who doesn't love a parade? The tradition of an inaugural parade dates back to the very first inauguration, when George Washington took the oath of office on April 30th, 1789, in New York. As he began a journey from Mount Vernon all the way to New York City, he, all the towns and all their military and, their, and other folks joined as he walked and formed this whole big parade. Following the arrival of the president, vice president, and their families to the White House is a parade that stretches almost 1.5 miles of Pennsylvania Avenue. With participants from all around the country and evolved from the post-inaugural celebrations. Now, of course, we won't have that this year. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then, of course, there's the celebratory, the, the entertainment value, if you will, of the inauguration that either side of the inauguration we see, the before or after the inauguration. There's typically in the past, there's been a huge concert before the inauguration, days before. I was lucky enough to be a part of the first Obama's administration's We Are One concert. What an event. And then on the flip side, there's some balls that the president and vice president and their, and their spouses get to hop around all night. In closure, just to identify what you're going to see or what was different about the Biden-Harris inauguration event this year because of the pandemic, because of the security concerns after January 6th, 6th event, it's going to be different. It's almost virtual. The mall, instead of filled with people, will be filled with flags from all around the country, different states, different organizations, from the Capitol all the way almost back to the Lincoln Memorial. There will be no grand balls over the DC that they have to go jump from all night long. And instead, there'll be a nice concert that will be aired live that will showcase different bands, different people, different organizations from all across the country. Is this the new way to do the things? Hopefully not. The pageantry surrounding the inauguration of a president is huge and it represents a big part of who we are as a country, who we are as a, as a nation, and in, it's hopefully in four years, regardless of what happens as, uh, with the presidency, we have what we are familiar with as an inauguration event. It's one of those events that make you proud to be an American. And don't we all know, right now, we need a lot of that kind of thing. I hope you've enjoyed this little trip down history lane and learning more a little bit about the inauguration of the President of the United States and the Vice President of the United States and learning a little bit what it would takes and what the changes have made for one of the most amazing things that happens in this country, some would say, the world. This is my last Tuesday 10 talk for a while. And I'm glad you've joined me, whether it's this one or all of them, or maybe this would be your last time. But I hope not, because I will be back. I will bring you more real soon. As always, I appreciate it and look forward to giving you some more Tuesday 10 Talk. I'm your host, Scott Foster. God bless America.